So much of the world today is ill-informed about symbols and signs. I try and help people to understand the symbolism, the hidden indicators of where we are in the period of time and where we're going. That's what I do. One of my favorite stories in the world of extraterrestrial contact is that of Val Thor, after whom the book Stranger at the Pentagon was written. His story was brought out by a man named Frank Strangis. Since my original fascination years ago, I've come into contact with people who were also in contact with Frank, including Hollywood film director Craig Campobasso. I'm really <laughs> happy to be here to see you, Regina. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, uh, since I first came in contact with that book years and years ago, I thought, I. You know, it felt real to me, but yeah. you always have to wonder, sure. is this someone's imagination? Sure, sure. I read it in the 80s myself, and, and I thought the same thing. And, you know, but when I actually looked at the photographs that were taken of Valiant Thor and uh, Vice Commander Dawn and Jill, who is a wife of another Vice Commander named Zan, I later found out from Dr. Frank, um, the photographs just resonated with me. You know, they, they did just, with they, me as they, well. They just felt genuine, and they were also taken by a retired Air Force photographer who was also a ufologist. And you can see in some of the photos that the group around them is kind of looking at them like, who are these guys? There they was something... actually are, and those photographs were taken on the, on the Howard Menger's farm, mm -hmm. who was also a contactee way back in the day. And uh, Dr. Frank actually connected me to Howard and his wife, and I spoke to his wife, Connie, also about that day, and she said every time they had UFO lectures, there were always visitors present. She called mm -hmm. them the visitors, and she said sometimes they would say who they were, and sometimes they wouldn't, but this particular time they didn't. And what's interesting about this is during that era, when we're looking back at the 50s in particular, and even into the 60s, the stories of alien contact had to do with people who were humanoid, right? usually attractive, yeah. Usually nicely dressed. Right. Big shift from what John Max started dealing with in the 90s and into the 2000s, which is this frightening gray abduction scenario, yeah, which is what started taking over the scene when people start thinking of the word alien contact. Yes. And yes. so th this was more in the sweet days when messages of importance were being delivered in a gentlemanly fashion. Yes, yes. And, and that there were, in, in these early days, that there were many people who were having contacts from yes. beings all over the place. I've gone and I've studied, um, especially at the Integratron back in the days when George Van Tassel had his UFO con space conventions where anywhere from five to 10,000 people would go and camp out in the desert. Dr. Frank Stranges used to host those That's things so funny. in the 50s and 60s five as Five to 10,000? Well. Five to now, 10, if I, a UFO I've seen Congress, photographs, yeah. Wow, and the Congresses yeah. of today are lucky to get two or 300 people yes, to show yes. up. And evidently back in those days, these beings from other places were more accessible mm -hmm. because it was new to them and they were coming because of the atomics that started happening in yes. the 40s and the danger it was posing to the rest of the universe and uh, you know all, all those kinds of things but it, it was fascinating so I really you know if people if people you know still think the story might be a little crazy um, is to, what I say is keep an open mind and, and research George Van Tassel and, and all of these people from that era you know, to see it, you know. Um, the, you know, the story is not going to get proved unless Valiant Thor walks in him, here, you know, right. himself. Well, these are more dangerous times to walk in. You know, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's still, I really wanted to make the film because I think it's a wonderful, fascinating story. It, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. you say that Val Thor was a created being. What does that mean? Well, a created being is, is someone that doesn't have a belly button. So they're, they're actually what we would call an angel in human form. Did, yeah. he, did he ever explain how that happens? 
um, how they're able to come into and create a f any kind of physical form and density. And density, you know, I, well, we know, we know from a lot of um, previous teachings and things that I've read is that created beings um, can be created through the Godhead through, you know, uh, or the universal head, you know, how, however, you know, you want to look at it, um, is that they can, they can create things at will. So, um, you know, it's not a challenge for someone who understands the creative process. Exactly. And there are human beings who can do this as well. Absolutely. We have to understand Absolutely. to create something like That's Balfour right. actually as our birthright. We just That's haven't right. remembered our way That's back right. to it yet. That's right. Okay. So, he arrives at the Pentagon. We're going to take a look at our very first um, clip right. from the film, okay? Yes. And it set this up for us a little bit because we want to know first, well, first of all, I should ask you, why did he come here? Well, he actually came with a divine design, which was to help eliminate sickness, disease, and poverty. Um, and it was a design um, from the Unification Council of which he was a part of, of which there are 12 members. And it was for Eisenhower to implement throughout the United States. And then once that proved successful throughout the world. So on that first meeting when they met uh, at uh, the White House on... We're going to see that clip in a little bit We're going to see too. that clip mm -hmm. in a little bit. Mm -hmm. but. Um, but the uh, you know, but his his main purpose was was coming just for that, and he was put on VIP status by Eisenhower for three years, where he actually they discussed how they how they could do this and how it could work and and all of that. But of course, there were major conflicts with all the other areas and the Joint Chiefs oh, and, and the CIA. Oh, and that's that morning and, when Eisenhower left office, and, beware of the military industrial complex. Yeah. That he, Val Thor must have figured prominently in that. Yeah. Right. So there was a reason Val Thor chose to connect with Eisenhower specifically. Yes, yeah, back in the day. So and yeah. you know, so. so he thought he was a man that had enough conscience that he could be capable of yes. helping these yes. reforms happen. Yes, and Dr. Frank explained to me that um, uh, Eisenhower and Nixon, who was vice president at the time, were actually very much in favor of the proposal. And you know where they got all of the conflict came in from all the other areas: the military, military. the CIA. Um, you know all of industry. those different, in, different in big industry, right. and, and of course, in the end, it was turned down because it would eliminate pharmaceutical That's companies, right. doctors, law, you know, everything uh, like that, and destroy the economy. So, um, so again, it went back to it went back to a monetary system and didn't okay. go back to a humanitarian. Okay. System. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, yeah. let's take a look at the clip where. Balthor arrives. All right, so this clip is where uh, his craft Victor One, which is 300 feet in diameter, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, holds up to 200 people, is arriving on Earth for the first time and is coming in for a landing. Beautifully done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that was really beautifully done. <laughs> um, and you said uh, that part of that a lot of this is CG, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, yeah, it's, computer generated graphics. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Images. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Really well done. Okay, so let's talk about once Val Thor arrived here. What was his original experience like? At when? How was he first greeted? And then, what was his experience in what the reception at the Pentagon like? Well, he was met by, you know, when his craft landed, the, mm -hmm. the first two on the scene were two police officers. And um, they actually had their guns drawn. And uh, when he walked off the craft, when they looked upon him, this, they felt the energy you know, of of this man, and they just immediately just dropped their arms and walked up to him, and they actually had a conversation. He said he wanted to see the president. They radioed ahead. You say, hey, they, we'll give you an escort. And you have to remember, this is on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. This was not, you know, he didn't come during the week. You know, actually, that would have caused havoc, right. if you think about it. So, 
Uh, it was March 16th, 1957. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was 8 a.m. in the morning. So, uh, you know, the city was awake, but not, you know, not at full function. So, so they, they rushed him to the Pentagon. Um, he met, uh, uh, he met with the Secretary of Defense, the Under Secretary of Defense. He met with some other military officials. They were all being called in. Uh, Eisenhower was being called in. Uh, Nixon, everybody was then going, they all met with him at the White House in the Oval Office. And that's where the first meeting took place. And Eisenhower's first words were, I have a good feeling towards you, sir. Please, what is your name? Should we take a look at that clip yes, now? Let's because take a, yeah. let's, let's do clip number yeah. two, and then we'll get deeper into the conversation sure. where Valiant Thor meets the president. Of course, you know, we've suspended all rules of protocol. I have a good feeling towards you. I'm President Dwight Eisenhower. Please, sir, what is your name? Commander Valiant Thor. Have there been any confirming documents, for example, by that were ever discovered by Eisenhower or Nixon or anyone else that was involved military regarding contact with this stranger at the Pentagon, or was this very deeply hidden? Well, I've never come across any documents. Mm -hmm. I've, I myself asked Dr. Frank. He didn't know of any documents. Um, the only thing that is recorded is Harley Bird, who was Admiral Richard E. Bird's nephew, was a part of Project Blue Book at oh, that yes. time. Oh, yes, yes. And actually, in the foreword to the book, he confirms the entire story, his arrival, his meeting with the president and him staying there at the Pentagon for three years. So he himself did confirm it. Excellent. And yeah. explain Project Blue Book for our viewers who aren't familiar with these terms. Uh, well, back in the, in the 50s, they created, um, uh, they created an organization to look into UFO sightings and, you know, people reporting and uh, all that, all that. So they would go out and they would investigate and see if things were correct or, you know, if people actually really saw something or, you know, that kind of thing. So they would log things and catalog. And this was a governmental. This was, yeah. Um, yeah. Study. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just to just set that straight. Yes. And then, of course, I think it was it in the '90s. They said, "Well, couldn't find anything." Fables. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. There were only thousands and thousands of documented cases, cases before they sure. threw it out the window. Sure. Okay. So when when did Frank Strangest come into the picture and and meet with uh, Valiant Thor? He was doing a lecture, a two-week lecture in uh, Washington, D.C. in December of 1959. And he actually was friends with August Roberts, who took the photographs of Valiant Thor and his crew members earlier at the Menger farm. And he had gone to Dr. Frank with the photographs and said, these people are not from here. That man right there had no fingerprints, no palm prints. And when he looked at me, it was like he was going deep into my soul. And it, you just felt different when you were And this has been him. from many people have said yes, the same yes, thing. Yes, they've all said the same yes. thing, even down to the thing that they, that his pheromones are even it, what you would call something that changes your senses and brings you into that God sort of centered place, you know, where, where he resides. So, um, so it's not only the sight, but it brings you in through all the senses. So um, anyway, but he, um, uh, uh, he, was, he was there doing a le this lecture and he had the photograph on, his, he had it blown up, mm -hmm. which I have. I have the actual photograph. His wife just gave it to me for the big movie, right? And he would have it up there and he would talk about, you know, he would have the Adamski ships and talk about that. Yes. And talk about things that were in the Bible as well. And then talk about, you know, Ezekiel and he'd talk about, um, uh, then he would say, and this is a photograph of a gentleman who is supposedly from another planet. You know, he never said that he was or that he wasn't. Um, and one of these nights at the lecture, what he did was, is he, um, 
uh, a woman came up to him when he was signing uh, books. He had a book then called Saucerama, which was all about flying saucers mm -hmm. and photographs and stories. And a woman came up to him, his, her name was Nancy Warren, uh, changed, of course, for the book. And she put her Pentagon badge underneath his face. And he looked at her and she, she pointed to the picture and she said, he wants to meet you. And she said, I will pick you up at your hotel tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And so those were, arrangements were made. She took him to the Pentagon. She took him in where, uh, you know, uh, they went through two guard gates. He didn't have a badge. I mean, this is like this great story that, you know, um, I forget what Dr. Frank called it. It's like trans, uh, trans imagery. Okay. Right? So they're, they're seeing something that's not there. So, you know, he would open his coat, boom, there's a badge, but there's no badge. And that's how he actually got, you know, through the two guard gates. So, and did he ever have, did Valiant ever explain why he chose Frank for this particular? Yes, yes, because he was a UFO investigator. Mm -hmm. and but there were many UFO there investigators. There were, but he was, he was also very open. Right. You know, Dr. Frank, and when you got to know him, and I got to know him very well, he was, not only was he a very open man, but he, he was a very genuine man. Mm -hmm. And he was kind mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and trustworthy and, and all, you know. Um, so I think that he whole probably, package that, that innocence healed. and kindness made and I probably think also resonate. being in the right place at the right yeah. time yeah. didn't hurt right. as well. So, so they had a first meeting and um, they discussed several things. Um, and one of which was his space suit, which weighed six ounces with the boots. And um, he said that, you know, at, at his urging, he had the government do tests on it. They tried to burn it with acid. It wouldn't burn. They fired a rifle at it. It wouldn't pierce. And back then they had a, they were, they were working on a laser, but it, back then it was called a maser. Mm -hmm. So they even did it with the maser on it. Nothing, uh, nothing would Could penetrate, penetrate that it. fabric. So, but yeah. he, what he also did is he told them uh, some personal things that he did not know himself. About, about himself? About, no, Dr. Frank, that he didn't know. Okay. That his parents had had a child before him. I see. That passed away at birth. Uh -huh. And that Dr. Frank was going that same way, but was helped along to stay in this world. Oh, interesting. So that, you know, even there, it makes me even think, was this you know, some predestined thing that was happening with well, Dr. Frank. Well, it seems so like it, because it, it was so profound. Like it yeah. Bit. yeah. You know, I want, so. to, I want to just back up for one second. Yeah. You, you mentioned it, Adams, Adamski, which was also being investigated at that time. Yeah. And that being, who was a human being, yeah. had a very similar kind of, I don't know, beatific, beautiful energy yes. about him, yeah. like Valiant Thor. Have yes. you ever, do you have any, th and by the way, for anybody watching, I did an interview with Glenn Steckling on that, oh. because his father, fo like Frank Stranges, followed the life and times of oh. Adamski, so yeah. you can watch that in the archives, but what's your, what is your thought on who Adamski may have been? Well, I, you know, I kind of think... Did he have he was, a belly button is what I mean. You know, well, I, I think that George Adamski had a belly button, <laughs> but maybe Orthon is mm -hmm. what they, you know, his uh, the person was supposedly from right. Venice as well. Right, right. Uh, you know, I'm sure was a, could have been a created being as well, but, but I don't A similar think kind of, of contact that that. and messaging but they, coming But here, here's the thing that we do know about these special beings, created beings, and fully conscious beings mm -hmm. um, who are in full power of 100% of their brain power, where we're only in like 30 some percent, right. is that they are balanced and masculine and feminine. So a lot of times the men will come off being... Um, even coming off uh, not uh, feminine, but they they have a lot of feminine qualities, and a lot of times they look very androgynous because yes. that the men like to sometimes wear long hair. Valiant Thor didn't, but yes. Orthon did. Yes. And if you didn't know and you saw this pure face, because of the, you know his face was just of purity, 
you wouldn't you, you wouldn't you know which wouldn't sex know what sex yes yeah. and i've seen many depictions yeah. of these beings yeah. through many sources and there's, and there's lots of androgynous beings throughout that's the right. universe yeah yeah exactly okay yeah. now going back to frank's story yeah. over what period of time then was he was he in contact with valiant thor those three years and was that the only time or did valiant thor continue being in contact with him after his days at the pentagon he met him on uh i believe it was december 24th it was christmas Eve, 1959. So Valiant Thor was leaving Earth on March 16th, 1960, the following year. So he didn't have contact with him. Uh, again, Valiant Thor returned, he said, on March 16th, 1961, and has been here ever since. And that he came back and um, uh, st uh, came back and, and had a uh, a meeting with him. He actually was driving in his car and he appeared in the back seat of his car, mm -hmm. he said, you know, and scared the bejeebies out of him. <laughs> yeah. And he pulled over and he got in the front seat and then they had a conversation and, and that they've uh, been friends ever since. Um, but they, um, 1968 was the first time that he went and visited uh, Victor One. Okay. Uh, which was his craft. his craft, and he met yeah. a lot of the crew members, which he became friends with, and uh, you know, throughout the years, and had a lot of great stories, you know. And to, this is also featured in the film, am I it correct? It is, yeah, yeah. Because the meeting a lot of, of the the crew. Yes, because a lot of people don't know about the crew, and the crew is extremely fascinating because you know, there's four vice commanders. There's Teal, um, Zan. Uh, Thon, T H O N N, mm -hmm. and Dawn, D O N N. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's one woman and three men. And then there is another created being on board. His name is Yanaya, and he comes from Melchizedek. Shall we take a look at that clip? Yes, we do yeah. have a clip. Let's of the take Vice a look Commanders. at it. Yeah. The Quine have infiltrated Earth. Our surveillance system did not detect their arrival. They've found a signal to block the current system. Thon, to circumvent this, I have new residence field signatures for you to implement into the computer's brain. Capital City's president is considering signing an agreement with them for their technology. This will set our mission back decades. McKeeseldeck has looked into all probable futures. There is not one hopeful outcome in the immediate years. Earth is in grave danger. Okay, very interesting, yeah. yes. Okay, so, after this period of time, um, he started having, he over this period of time, being in contact with human beings and the military, the military industrial complex, uh, large industry, corporate America at large. How, how did this start impacting him? And, and from according to Frank Stranges, what happened with Valiant in terms of his ideals and and what did he feel that there was a possibility any of these ideals were going to be met or that there was going to be resistance well you know that was a, a interesting questions that i asked dr frank and then i had to even take it a step beyond because you have to think the way a created being would think and so how did, since how was we're he's... not created beings, yeah. it's hard to think in their manner. But you know, they're they're all knowing. They they sense. They feel. So yes, they would know that there would be conflict. But there might be several avenues of which that conflict would present itself in mm -hmm. the end result. So so they you know. But I think the thing that was most um, uh, touching. Um, is that when they experience these things, being fully conscious, being beings of total envelopment of unconditional love, right? Not being in duality, like we're in duality and we, we live in you know, this world like we are today, but, um, but then to see the horrors of things that were happening behind the scenes, the things that were happening on the earth, wars, all of that, they would feel it on a heightened level. Mm -hmm. So even how we feel when we see everything that's happening in the world even today, and, and we see how many people die in a war and a bombing and a this, you take it a step further and for a created being and a fully conscious being, it 
it tears them up inside, it just increases that amount it's of emotion. Magnified. It's magnified. Craig, thank you so much for sharing this. I just adore this story. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love being here. As I said at the top of the show, this is a fascinating story, and thank goodness Craig is bringing it to light via film. Watch out for Stranger at the Pentagon by checking his website, strangeratthepentagon.com. Until next time, thank you for joining us here at Guyam TV. Common people around the world are doing the uncommon. I mean, it is literally the Netflix of spirituality.